Hi everyone, my name is Susie and I'm going to be your guest lecturer for today. I'm going to start you guys off with language, thought, and intelligence, and I'm going to be covering language. We have a variety of definitions for language, and these definitions are going to change depending on who you talk to. So the definition that we have here is our spoken, written, or signed words, and the ways that we use them in order to think to ourselves and to communicate with others. So through language, we can transfer meaning from person to person in a variety of contexts, whether it's communicating day to day for daily functioning, or transferring accumulated knowledge or teaching, much like what I'm doing with you guys right now. How would we define language communication? For example, if you were to see a friend walking 100 feet away from you, how might you communicate with this person? You might shout out their name, you might wave to them, or you might just shout a quick, hey, and that would probably be the extent of your communication with this person. How would this change if the same person were 10 feet away from you, or even closer than that? You might not shout at them like you would if they were 100 feet away, but you would probably use a softer, uh, more inside voice. Um, and you would probably be able to have more um, intimate conversation with them rather than just shouting a quick hey. So what would give you clues of your friend's mood and intentions? For instance, let's say that your friend was sad. How would you tell that your friend is sad? Uh, some examples are uh, their facial expressions might give it away. They might frown a little bit, they might stare at the ground or look into the distance. They might have a closed off body language, so their arms might be crossed over like this, or they might just come out and say it and just say, um, I'm feeling kind of sad today. So all of these examples fall within two categories of communication, and that would be verbal communication and nonverbal. So verbal communication would include stuff like speech, obviously, and the word choice whenever they do speak, and it might also include vocal tone or pitch. So for example, um, what I was saying earlier, your friend might just say, I'm feeling sad, um, but also their, their voice might be a little bit shaky, maybe um, softer or lower than normal. So that would all be under verbal communication. Whereas nonverbal communication would include writing or in this day and age texting, um, gestures and sign language, facial expressions and body language. So with your friend, their facial expression might be a frown. And as I said before, body language might be closed off. Paul Václavik, who was a family therapist and philosopher has this legacy of a quotation saying one cannot not communicate. So what do you think this would mean? Well, it would mean no matter your intentions of communicating with others or not communicating with others, you are still communicating. Let's say that a husband and wife are having a fight and the husband thinks to himself, I'm not going to talk to my wife. I don't want to even look at her right now. And so he would sit back and he would probably not look at her and he would not speak to her and he would think, I'm just not going to communicate at all. Even the very act of doing that can be interpreted by another person. So the wife would see her husband sitting there and she could interpret just by his facial expressions and body language alone, interpret that to mean, wow, he must be very upset. So no matter what you're doing, you are probably communicating with someone else in some shape or form. So tying this all back into the definition of language, we can come to a more technical way of thinking about language. So this would be a system for communicating with others using signals um, that are combined and that abide by a set of grammatical rules in order to convey significant and meaningful messages. 
And grammar is a set of rules that specify how these units of language can be uh, combined in order to effectively um, convey these messages. So we can break language down into its most basic units. And the basic unit of language is the phoneme. So phonemes are smallest units of sound that are recognizable as speech rather than just random noise. So we can take the example, um, let's say we have the word toy. Toy would be uh, made up of three phonemes, t, o, e, toy. And you can think about it as um, if you've ever heard a young child learn to read, um, or maybe you've even done this yourself when you were learning to read, um, they come across a word that they are not familiar with, and they might sound out the word. And what they're actually doing is sounding out the word phoneme by phoneme. And different languages have a different number of phonemes. So English has about 40 phonemes. Some languages have as many as 85 and others as few as 12. Um, and each language um, has a set of phonemes that are governed by phonological rules. And these rules indicate how phonemes can be combined to produce these speech sounds. So for example, in English, the P and B sounds are two different phonemes. Whereas in the Hindi language, um, P and B sounds are actually the same phoneme, so there would not be a difference. So those who uh, are native Hindi speakers have trouble differentiating between these two sounds, whereas native English, speech, English uh, speakers can pretty easily differentiate between these two phonemes. As well, some phonemes in one language are not acceptable in other languages. This is sort of how we can tell the difference between which um, languages are spoken. So for instance, we can just by hearing, even though we might not understand these languages, we can probably tell the difference between um, Spanish and French, let's say, just because of their set of phonemes and the phonological rules that, that are implemented in these in these languages. Um, also, if um, let's say that somebody is learning a new language, they might violate these phonological rules, which would result in an accent because the, the these phonological rules for that particular language are distorted and violated. Going a step above phonemes, we have morphemes, which are combinations of phonemes. And these are defined as the smallest units of meaning in language. So these would include words. The example that I have up here is use. So that's made up of a few different more, uh, phonemes, but as a unit of meaning, that is the smallest unit of meaning. So these can also include prefixes and suffixes such as the prefix re. So let's say that we have a morpheme test. We all know what test means. It's the smallest unit of meaning. Um, if we add the prefix re to it, so that now that we have retest, all of a sudden that word takes on a whole new meaning. And just as phonemes follow phonological rules, morphemes follow morphological rules, and those indicate how morphemes can be combined to produce words. We also have a, a couple different types of morphemes. So one type is content morphemes, which indicate things and events. So they're mostly going to be nouns and verbs, such as cat, dog, throw, and take. We also have functional morphemes, which indicate which serve a um, grammatical purpose and this is what makes human language so complex because some functional morphemes serve to uh, combine sentences or tie together sentences such as and or or but and others represent um, others describe time and about half of the morphemes in human language are function morphemes 
So here we have a visual representation of how we can break down units of language. So we have our overall sentence, the boy hit the ball. We can break that sentence down into phrases, the boy hit the ball. And we can break that down even further into its individual morphemes. So here we have one morpheme per word, the boy hit the ball. And lastly, we can break that down even further into phonemes. So notice for the word the, that's made up of two phonemes, the TH sound and the E sound. We would not break down the TH sound further into an individual T and H because those letters by themselves are two different phonemes. Um, but in combining those two letters, we have a completely new phoneme that would stand all on its own. So we would not break that down further. And as I've said before, grammar is the set of rules that govern how a language can be conveyed. So we have these two sentences, I ate the pizza, the pizza is what I ate. So those are both pretty much the same sentence. Um, they're worded a little bit differently, but they both follow the rules of grammar in the English language. We also have syntactical rules, which indicate how these words can be combined to form sentences. So the first sentence, have no I syntax, that does not follow the syntactical rules of the English language. However, the second sentence does. And we have another visual representation of how we can break down grammar in the English language. So this might look a lot like your high school English classes. So we have our overall sentence, the dog eats a juicy bone. We can break that down into the noun phrase, the dog, and the verb phrase, eats a juicy bone. And we can break that down even further, labeling um, the function of each word, and so on and so forth.